Welcome everyone to week seven. Uh, we're looking at another P now, which is place or channel or distribution, and the importance of that particular element in the subject of marketing. So talking about marketing and marketing channels, it's really a very actually complicated interdependent set of companies and organizations that allow you to transfer ownership of products made by manufacturers ultimately to either business users or uh, consumers as well. And actually many companies can provide actually or have core competencies associated with the supply chain. One example is Walmart owns its whole entire supply chain. So when you look on the road and you see these Walmart or Sam's Clubs uh, trucks driving, those are Walmart vehicles. They do all their own IT. Uh, they have people dedicated to efficiencies and teasing out uh, costs, bringing out costs from their supply chain. So supply chains can be very significant and they can be a core competency for an organization. And, and essentially what you're trying to do with a supply channel is is really overcome discrepancies, improve you know contact efficiency with your customers and because of that you can get some benefits associated with uh, efficiencies in any part of it and that can translate to cost and sometimes there's some niche and uh, service elements that customers can do as well. If you're looking at the four different core comp uh, discrepancies there's you know you need a hundred but somebody wants to buy a thousand. Uh, you need uh, ten red ones and five blue ones and you have five ten blue ones and five red ones so those kinds of things are an example of a discrepancy, a discrepancy of assortment and then you have something where it's known as a temporal discrepancy where you're not really ready to buy something yet or you don't know that you need to buy it but then you're made aware of it so there can be a disconnect there and then you need you need a hundred shovels in Columbus because that's where the snowstorm is but all the shovels are located you know 200 miles away in Indianapolis or something of that nature so what supply chain does is it helps to smooth out these uh, inefficiencies and the discrepancies that come up because of what consumers want and what suppliers can provide them with and this slide here does a really nice job of showing how an intermediary it actually shows Circuit City in this case which I need to change I keep saying that every time I use the slide but because they're no longer in existence uh, it's better to put Best Buy there but then you start to wonder about Best Buy themselves with all the issues that they're running into as well in in the retail sector which we'll talk a, a little bit about later on in the slide set but you can see through here that instead of having each company having to deal with each consumer now you deal with this big intermediary and they deal with the individual consumers so instead of having 20 transactions as you see on the top half of the slide you actually only have nine transactions associated with uh, putting a proper intermediary in there. There's all kinds of intermediaries. Retailers are the ones that we know the most and have the most experience with as consumers. There's wholesalers, agents, or brokers. A uh, key thing to remember here is the difference between an agent and a broker and everything else into the intermediate cha inter intermediary channel is that agents or brokers don't take title to goods or don't take ownership. Perfect example that most people associate with are retailers, are realtors that are selling homes. The uh, person that's selling still owns it until they sell it and the agent or broker gets a commission but they never really take ownership of the home. Uh, and then of course the and that doesn't happen until it's sold to somebody else and uh, title transfers. Uh, talks, this slide talks a little bit about wholesaling versus um, the use of a traditional retailer and uh, next slides are kind of talk about basically intermediaries if you look at consumers and this is actually again one that we would be most associated with sometimes producers sell directly to consumers and with the advent of the internet over these many short years uh, you can have people that basically put up a an e-commerce website for a, a manufacturer and you can buy directly from them the one that we're most familiar, familiar with is when retailers are there, the Best Buys, the Old Navies, the um, McDonald's, if you think about it that right there, a retailer as well, a retailer food. And then you have uh, sometimes a wholesale that's in between there, and then even there's channels that have agents or brokers and that. And if you can see here on the right-hand side, you have many different stages or intermediaries. 
clearly each one along the way is going to want to make money. The beauty of the internet is in many cases you can go directly to a producer and save money, but you have to be really careful about in many cases businesses have many of these different channels enough to support all four. So pricing becomes very dicey in an arrangement like this. You could say, well, I'll just sell directly to consumers. That's not a problem. But remember, intermediaries, in particular retailers, do provide a service. Uh, it does cost money. Ultimately, you think you can put up an e-commerce website and then you're good to go. There's service elements, returns, uh, support, all these things that have an influence on cost. So it, it's not that much of a slam dunk as you might think little difference here is uh, you don't see when you're talking about business products you don't typically have a retail store if you're, so if you're buying um, guns and bombs and complex things from uh, an organization if you're the government uh, is usually not a store you can go to get that stuff you typically have to deal directly with a producer or a very very specialized industrial distributor Okay, let's see what else I want to focus on here. You know, supply chains, this is a good visual that shows, you know, something's made in a factory and it needs to come out and go through many different paths. Uh, there's cost associated with all of that and how people streamline the supply chain can uh, be, again, as I mentioned earlier, a key competitive advantage. Uh, market forces here. Uh, product factors, if your product is very complex, it's unlikely you're going to be able to sell directly to your end user. Product delicacy, for instance, food, things that need to be frozen, certain kinds of drugs that need to be kept at a certain temperature. If you're in the product life cycle and you're on the end, the things that will affect the channel will be very different than if you're trying to grow your business and just starting up the uh, product life cycle. So all these things have an impact on which channel that you choose. Uh, can you go you know, direct to consumer? Uh, can you sell at mass retail? All this stuff has an influence on and based on what kind of product you're selling. You know, for instance, you wouldn't sell a Lamborghini at um, you know, sort of a car max, if you will, right? a uh, large uh, type of car uh, establishment. You'd have a very specialized store in a very special location catering to a very small segment of people. You're selling a Chevy Volt. Uh, even that's actually a little kind of different because um, you're talking about a hybrid or a, a quote-unquote quasi all-electric car so that's a bit different selling but if you're selling a um, a standard level you know Chevy Nova that's gonna be something that you could pretty much easily sell at any dealership uh, and, and not have too many concerns about it uh, we talked about the three different types and the, the levels of intensity there are issues associated with channel and channel management in particular channel conflict control of the channel uh, these things do happen if you're trying to get to as many customers as possible, if you're not careful how you manage the channels, sometimes the channels can compete against each other. Uh, you can get a price war that results, and the people that end up losing are the manufacturers because they didn't manage that control right. So that's an example of channel conflict and something that people and manufacturers need to be very, very careful about, for sure. Uh, that just talks about the different ways to sort of manage and develop products. Electronic data interchange has been a while, around for a while, inventory control and so on and so forth. I'm not too concerned about that. You know, people, when you buy something, you're also paying for the cost it took to get that from the manufacturer to you. So a lot of the products in this country I mean, come from Asia and particularly China. You think, wow, it's got to cost a ton of money for that stuff to come over. It does, but because the labor rates are so low, uh, and you balance that against the cost to move it here and typically it comes by boat it's the cheapest most uh, it's not the quickest way clearly but it's certainly the cheapest way uh, to ship in bulk and you know so you've got to factor that in to all the different decisions you make that is part of the channel getting it from the manufacturer to that shelf store you know when you walk into that stop and shop and you're trying to buy that item it's why is it there when you need to buy it so the type of transportation mode you pick and and by the way and I'm sure this is obvious to all of you but when you hear free shipping there's no free shipping they're just incorporating that shipping price in what you pay because trust me nobody gets it shipped for free 
So it's just a pricing exercise, a pricing technique that's used. But uh, you know, transportation costs, in particular for fragile, delicate items, uh, items that can expire in terms of you know food, that type of thing, is a huge part of the cost of getting products to you, and the huge can be a huge part of what you pay. For instance, bottled water, biggest part of the cost is the shipping cost. The water, the bottling, costs next to nothing. Right? It's probably the smallest component of the price of a, a bottle, a bottle of water. So keep that in mind when you uh, see this. Retailing is another big area here uh, of channeling. It's something that we're most familiar with as consumers. It also ends up being a very significant part of the GDP of the United States. A lot of people employed. A lot of uh, businesses uh, involved in this. It's up to 40% of the gross domestic product of the United States. That's a pretty big number. And this kind of just shows it uh, different in a different way visually by a pie chart. It's big. There's different kinds of operations. You have franchises, chain stores, independent retailers. Some retail, you know, you go to a factory outlet to a BJ's Wholesale Club or a Costco, you don't expect you know, white glove service. You go in with Tiffany's, there's somebody meeting at your door. There's somebody that probably knows you. They'll have your latte ready for you when you go sit down and, and you're buying. So all, you know, you have a, a very wide sort of swath of levels of service there, clearly. Uh, this gives you, this slide here gives you an overview of the many different types and classifications of stores. You know, restaurants are retails. There's off-price, specialty, drug stores. Can be all these, and there's subcategories along these. Um, and and certainly when you're talking about uh, you know product, we also talk, have to talk about uh, excuse me about the channel. The price gets into this. The concept of gross uh, margin is important. We'll talk more about that later. But remember when we were talking about free shipping, right? Um, there's no free shipping, and the pricing that you might expect for one the same item in a Walmart might be very different than what you pay at a CVS and it might be very different than you pay at a convenience store because of the location. So we'll spend more time on pricing later on obviously because it's the last of the four P's that we we end up looking at as I go the wrong direction here. Um, so here's just the next sort of slides probably, uh, provide you with a bit more detail on some of the different vagaries. This is just a different visual representation of what we saw listed in the other chart, no really different. Um, automatic vending, right? Uh, direct email. Oh, that's all examples of non-store retailing. When you see that red box at the uh, Cumberland Farms, that is retailing, right? Uh, the the vending machine where you're getting your soda or your water or your, uh, you know, your unhealthy snack uh, at work or in a building that you may be in, that is retailing. All of that is. There used to be, at least when I was growing up, a little bit more door-to-door. -door. You don't see, or office-to-office, -office, you don't see that any, anymore. But home sales parties is still very, very big. Things like Pampered Shelf, Avon, uh, all these parties for these specialty kinds of products. Definitely still very big and uh, a very healthy industry in terms of retailing. Uh, direct mail, you used to get more stuff in the mail. Now it's more email and blast emails. You don't see as much telemarketing as there used to be. Catalogs and mail order are still very big. Uh, franchise is a very popular model uh, in the United States. Uh, here's a list of the top 20. This is kind of dated. It's 2008, but there hasn't been too much uh, uh, variation in these. 7-Eleven, Subway, Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, all examples of franchise models where you are given the right by a franchisor uh, to um, use the information and the products and the, the marketing power behind the company and in return for every percentage of what you sell they get something back. The reason a franchise model makes sense is because there's a lower risk associated with it because they've already established the product clearly. So you know there's a uh, lower risk so uh, a little less return. There's two more P's actually in retailing that we have to be worried about and um, that's, oh, hold on there. there we go. Then we've got both presentation and personnel. So the people that might work at a Walmart, very different than the people that work at Abercrombie and Fitch. You walk into a Walmart, you know you're in one. You walk into an 
Abercrombie and Fitch. Sadly, you know you're in one of those as well. The lighting, the music, the scents, the organization of everything, how people you know uh, deal with you. All these things have an impact and are different in in retail, and it adds two more wrinkles and elements to the traditional four Ps that we we know about. And you know how you pick all of that makes a, a difference. How you you know these organizations have to promote themselves just like anybody else does. In real estate, there's three important things. Location, location, and then location. No different in retail. Where you put a store, in what environment, whether it's freestanding, shopping center, mall, uh, where it's physically located, the demographics of the neighborhood. All these things are pretty important in retail. And you can have a store, and I'll give you for instance, I used to travel to Texas a lot. And was a uh, and there is was is a franchise down there called Dickie's Barbecue Pit, spectacular if you're into Texas barbecue. It's basically a chain restaurant for Texas barbecue, and it's widely successful in the South. Uh, I was just overjoyed uh, the other day, uh, about a year or so ago, to find out that there's a there was a Dickie's Barbecue Pit two towns over from me. Oh, I mean, it was wonderful. And it tasted the same as it did down in Texas. It was no different. The model was the same. And I said, this is going to be great. It's going to be successful. Only problem was it was in a strip mall. And it was too far away from the main drag. Within a year, sadly, the place closed. Uh, and it probably closed because the rent was pretty high. And the signage wasn't very good. It was at the end of a strip mall. The traffic really didn't go through there. And just not. it didn't develop enough critical mass, even though... The product was spectacular, and proper Texas barbecue is an acquired taste here up in the Northeast. So all those things, I think, and I think the location and other elements, uh, the inflows, traffic organization, is what killed the store, despite having a great, great product. So there's a good example of where location really matters. Next uh, bunch of slides talks about the differences in uh, location and the types of locations retail can have. All of those have pros and cons. I'm not really going to go into the particulars there. What a store looks like, hugely important, right? I mean, you wouldn't have a Saks Fifth Avenue on a strip mall. It would be part of a larger, it might be a freestanding store depending on what neighborhood it's in, but more than likely Saks tends to be associated with malls. And it would be a high-end mall. It wouldn't have it at a garden variety mall that uh, anybody goes to. So um, what the store looks like is huge. You know, sight, smell, in the case of food, uh, a restaurant taste. But all these things have an influence on what retail looks like. Um, and so that kind of gives you an overview of uh, the distribution and place element. And um, the, if I actually will post one more uh, for on Nordstrom, which is the case study that uh, we've had you take a look at. So, again, as always, you need anything, have any questions, feel free to reach out either through the discussion board, email, or a phone calls a lot as well. I will try to set up a Skype call next week, probably Thursday, but I'll send a separate email on that as well. Have a good weekend, guys.